I'm going to talk a little bit about the scale of our universe, um, why I believe we can understand it, and how you can participate. So the universe, it's a pretty big place. This is the view that you would see probably from Chestertown, not from Baltimore. Um, this is a very dark sky and lots and lots of stars, billions and billions, as Carl Sagan said. This is actually looking into uh, the heart of our galaxy. Um, our perspective, of course, is from our planet. Uh, we are pretty small in respect to that planet, but that planet is minuscule with respect to the rest of the universe. For example, um, this is uh, to scale the sun and the planets in our solar system, as well as many other bodies, including the dwarf planet Pluto. Don't yell at me. Um, Earth is here. And you can see that, that the planets that actually dominate the solar system are Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, our solar system is it's called 100,000 astronomical units, where the astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun because it's all about us. Um, but it's 9 trillion miles. So 9 trillion miles just to get out of our local vicinity. Um, just to show you some Hubble views of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Jupiter really dominates the solar system. If we were somewhere else looking at our solar system, this is the planet we would discover, and maybe um, Saturn. And uh, they both have very extensive 60 or more moons of their own um, surrounding them. Now, if we step away from the solar system, the next place we might think about going is the next nearest star, and so notice that um, I put many different measurements. This is the same measurement, but this speed, 36,500 miles per hour, is the speed that it takes a rocket to exit the solar system. So if we want to get out of the solar system and go somewhere else, we have to go that fast, and it would take 79,000 years at that speed to get to the next star, OK? So the next one, it would take 390,000 uh, years and across our, and I'm not even going to use those numbers anymore, but across our galaxy, it's 600 trillion miles or 100,000 light years. So that's why we start using different measurements. Um, our sun itself has been around the galaxy. It goes around the galaxy in its own orbit about halfway out. It's been around only about 20 times. So what's in the galaxy besides our solar system? There are large star formation regions. This is gas and dust, which is forming stars. Um, and uh, this is a big region in the constellation of Carina. This is a similar region in the constellation of Orion. This is actually a fuzzy area um, near the belt, the dagger of uh, Orion again, forming stars. What happens at the end of that process is the stars blow away all the material from which they were born and leave something like a star cluster. Um, at the end of a star's phase, it makes more of that material, blows off its atmosphere, and then that stuff starts recycling around and making more stars. And the whole galaxy is filled with that process going on continually. If we then step out a little bit there, we are located in a place called the local group. Um, I'm whipping through this, but this is giving you the scales. They're really enormous scales. Um, we can't think about them in miles and kilometers anymore. We have to use light years and other measurements um, that astronomers use. Um, this is a 3D map that has been made of the universe Part of the reason that we can't see this region is it's blocked by our own galaxy. So it's, it's kind of like being in an apartment and being able to see up and down, but not sideways in a city. So that's kind of what the picture is about. And we move out through the universe. And by m taking measurements of the farthest objects we can find, we find out that the universe is 13 and a half billion years old. What's in that universe? Well, the next nearest galaxy in our local group is the Andromeda Galaxy, or M31. Very similar to our own galaxy, but a little bit larger. There are other galaxies out there populating the universe of various sizes and shapes. And again, I'm just, I, I could talk about this for three hours. 
um, but I'm trying to go through it in a matter of minutes. We also find out that galaxies like this are colliding, and so there are many beautiful examples of that. And then if we step out further in the universe, um, we see the collisions, isolated galaxies, everything in this tiny little part of the sky is a galaxy. In this picture, I think there are three stars. That's a star, and there are two others. But everything else that you see, every dot, is a galaxy. And that's true for all over the sky. So the scale, then, um, we people are about a meter or so, three feet, six feet. Um, that's us. This is the scale we just went through, but we also live in a universe that has very tiny scales. So we go down um, several millions of times smaller. We get to skin, chromosomes, DNA, molecules, nucleus, atom, electrons, subatomic particles. So we're kind of right in the middle of this huge scale and this tiny scale. But somehow, I believe, that we can understand that. Um, many philosophers have asked, how is it that possible? How can we um, actually understand that when we are actually products of the universe? We're made of the universe, so doesn't that give us some kind of bias? It is true, it might be like being a fish in the sea and not knowing about the land. But we have an or scientists have an organized process for trying to understand the universe and by using our brains that are of the universe, I believe we can understand some significant part of it. So these are some of the principles that scientists go by. Um, basically, that the universe has some kind of structure and it's organized, that we can hypothesize about it and then take observations and test those theories, see what lurks, see what doesn't work, generate new questions, continue on. But basically, I mean, philosophy is really wonderful, but for a scientist, it has to be testable for us to accept it. And so that's the world we live in. You may not like that, but that's the world I live in and am very comfortable with. If I can test it, I can see it, or I can make some kind of test up, then I can start to understand the universe around me. And the great thing about it is it, it is a very imaginative, discovery-oriented thing. It's not a list of things that we're going to check off and say, I understand that, I understand that, I understand that. It's, it's really quite creative. It is a human process. So how do astrophysicists go about this? Well, I'll talk through a simple example, which is in the early days, in the early Greek days, their view of the universe was that there was a fixed sphere of stars, and the planets were kind of problematic because they moved around. So they had this idea of these concentric spheres that held stuff that moved around. Um, in the Copernican system, he basically, Copernicus figured out that if you, if you actually put the sun at the center, it would be much easier to predict where the planets were and also how the star m stars moved. Then, moving further on, Kepler and Galileo took many observations, making much more precise logs of where the planets were, where the stars were, um, what time, exact time, and all that. And out of that grew a curiosity about what makes this stuff work. And that's where Newton came in, maybe got hit on the head by an apple, and theorized that gravity was the thing that was making these models work. So for a long period of time, it was observation, in improving the technology, making a better theory, and then finally a discovery of, oh, there's actually a physical process that's making this happen. And this is where the breakthrough for gravity was. Then beyond that, in the 1700s and on through the 1900s, was the discovery through better optics of these fuzzy things out in the universe. What are they? Are they like the things around us making stars? No, there are other galaxies. So that's how the whole process progressed. Finally, um, not finally, but Edwin Hubble had the breakthrough of doing a taxonomy, taxonomy of, uh, and classifying galaxies. Here are some exam pictures of examples of isolated galaxies that fit into the scheme. Then, 
through Hubble Space Telescope and some ground observations, we find out that there are many galaxies which are interacting. And now we have to understand the theory of how the universe formed, how these galaxies collide into each other, how stars are made, and how planetary systems like our own are made. So it's all starting to fit together through the improvement of technology, observation, and vast imagination. And finally, part of the goal is to use all this information to understand the structure of the universe. So what I want to convince you of is that I believe through the process of science, which is not a checklist, it's a very exploratory, imaginative, creative process that allows us to think about things that are, that are a little bit different than the way that we accept things day to day. And that helps us understand this huge scale or this tiny scale. And because I'm an arrogant astrophysicist, I feel <laughs> that you know, an understanding of physics is an understanding because chemistry comes from physics, biology comes from physics, all molecules, biological reactions, everything comes from physical processes which we can, if we try hard enough, we can understand. So the next part that I want to convince you of is that you can do this. If you don't believe me, then you go try it. And I'll bet you, you will convince yourself that you can understand some of this stuff without having a PhD in astronomy or physics. And the way to do that, one way, there are many ways, but one way is through citizen science. And what citizen science is, I mean, I guess what you would probably think of is uh, like bird watching, okay, where people are looking at counting birds, people do this for uh, plants, um, the fall foliage, things like that. But this is a way of actually con contributing to science projects, to actual research, which astronomers and other scientists are doing through your activity. And many of these activities require human cognition, understanding, some of them require vision, they certainly require reasoning, but they don't require a PhD in astronomy or any other discipline. And so a couple of the examples of these sciences are here. Um, these are pretty much astronomy ones. I'm going to show you on another slide some of the other projects. The project really started with the galaxy formation, which I showed you some galaxies. The idea is we need to classify them, as Hubble did, we have to look at the ones that interact and, and classify them and then see how does that change as we look back in time. And we can use the Hubble telescope data to do that. So there are activities within the Zooniverse where you can classify galaxies and participate with other people like or different um, from yourselves to contribute to this research. Here's an example of one of the activities which is looking into how galaxies form and using the Hubble data to look back in time and amassing information. A small team of 10 scientists cannot do this alone. They need many, many, many people to look at the data to make sense of it. Another example is a project that I'm working on a little bit which is the Kepler project to look for uh, extrasolar planets planets around other stars. The data from this, the satellite, which is in orbit now, is presented through the Zooniverse site. You can look at the data and see if you can discover some planets. And many have been discovered by citizens such as well. So here are some other examples of the project. So there's, I talked about the planets. There's a star formation activity where you look at those, some of those regions that I showed you that have bubbles and stuff moving around. You can classify those and contribute to the science. But there are other sciences as well, things like tracking whales, um, looking at uh, some text from, from the ancient Greek, help, helping to actually transcribe some of the, the ancient uh, papyrus. And there's another really interesting one on climate where the ship logs have to be transcribed. People can do that. A machine can't do that yet. And they need hundreds and thousands of these ship logs to be recorded from the 1800s through today. So with that, I will close and say, think about whether we really can think about this huge scale. Maybe you will agree with me and maybe you won't. 
but have a hand at it and see if you convince yourself that we can get a handle about this amazing universe that we live in. Thank you.